Welcome, Peter Blake. Thank you. So happy to have you in the circle. My pleasure. You are the owner of the Peter Blake Gallery, mm -hmm. uh, art dealer, very popular Laguna Beach resident and city council fiend. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman, council person, council member. Um, so you and I go way back. I was in, in anticipation of you being here trying to figure out when we met, and um, it was about 18 years ago. Um, our mutual friend Dennis Moran had a dinner party, and you were there, and uh, I started coming to your art showings, and we've just been friends ever since, so I'm so happy to have you here. My pleasure. Um, your name and your gallery are uh, very well known in the art community. Um, Stellar, I would say, is a word I would use. Um, you have basically become the foremost authority of West Coast minimalism and modern art. And yet when a lot of people, you know, think about modern art, they're not even really sure what that means. How do you describe minimalism or modern art? Well, modern art... Um uh, it depends on how how closely you want to define it, but it could go into art of the uh, the mid century post war, uh, with contemporary being what's been done today. Uh, minimal art is art that um, could have its beginning in the pyramids, um, and it could also be what you know what most people uh, consider minimal with a capital M, which would be the New York School, the Donald Judds of the world. Um, I specialize in, and have always loved California minimalism. And within the context of California minimalism, you have California light and space and also hard edge painting. And those are the two, um, the two aspects of contemporary art coming out of California that since the early 90s when I opened um, have always interested me the most. Why is that? How, how did you get interested in art and modern art in particular? I, I, I've tried to figure that out for a long time. I, I was out, uh, um, I grew up in the restaurant business. My father was a restaurateur and that's what I thought that I would also be. And I was working um, at uh, Romeo Cucina, an Italian restaurant on Fort, on, uh, in Laguna. You know what? I didn't even know you in those days. And I don't know if you know that I did the marketing for Mario Cucina for a while. No, yeah. I didn't know that. I um, love those guys and love that restaurant. I, they were like the, the Italian family uh, they used to call me their prodigal son. Um, and after being a waiter for a while, they um, they promoted me to general manager. And I was out celebrating that night. There was an English pub in town. And we were drinking black and tans and uh, smoking some funny stuff. And I uh, walked past my first location. And I looked inside and I thought, wow, that's a really cool looking space. I, I think that would be a really great gallery. And I went home and I kept thinking about it. And two days later, I found myself um, inside, the, uh, inside the space with the owner of the shopping center, a Greek man named Soto Kafetsopoulos. Um, I learned to spell his name because he told me that there's no way I'm renting you a space. You're young, you have no art experience, you have no money, you have no credit. I mean, he, he <laughs> put down a list of everything. And he that, was right, right? <laughs> no, he was absolutely, no, it was no, there was no arguing, yeah. arguing against any of it. But what, what I did have was a job. And I, you know, I, I at the time was taking home um, Twenty One Twelve, which was an album I grew up with, a Rush album uh, as a kid in high school. And I told him, I said, you know, Soto, you're right. I can't even argue about any of those things, but I do have a paycheck I get every two weeks, and I'm happy to, to sign that over, pay to the order of Soto Kafetsopoulos. Every two weeks, you'll get half your rent. And you know, I'll never be that far behind because as soon as I miss that first one, you can start the eviction process. And he, he looked at me and I could tell his, his eyes were just spinning like, oh my God, <laughs> what am I gonna do with this guy? And he said, okay, I'll do it. So I went back and I told the family that um, I'm opening an art gallery, but I will still you know, do the job. Um, I will not be able to work lunch and dinner, you know, but I will be able to work six nights a week I, I just need one day off, um, you know, that'll be Monday, but I'll work six, uh, six days, um, six nights a week at the restaurant, I'll work the gallery seven days. And they said, okay, as long as you, as long as that doesn't interfere with, uh, with your job here, and as long as we have full access to you, so if someone calls in sick during the day, 
we can call you and you'll find someone to replace them. Or if we run out of credit card paper, whatever it is, yeah. anything, yeah. we're going to call you. You were pretty um, motivated. I was motivated. I didn't have a lot of uh, customers at the time walking into the gallery. So I had plenty of time to run the restaurant during the day. And, and, and they had, you know, uh, they had staff that they had family, sisters, a big family that, you know, one sister handled the accounting and the brothers handled the cooking. And, and there was really not that much I needed to do when the restaurant was closed. But when the restaurant opened, um, then I worked the front of the house and I, I managed everything that took place within the the context of drinks, uh, service, and all of that. So how did you decide what type of art to sell in your gallery? Uh, well, I had to scramble um, after Soto said yes, and I had to figure out what I, what kind of a gallery was this going to be. And uh, I had a friend of mine who um, used to go to Bali, and he would come back with all of these handicrafts, and he represented these artists. And I thought, you know, I went to him, and, and we sat down, and we talked about it. And he said, you know, I'm happy to uh, to work with you on this if, if this is what you want. Um, and there was um, a bartender at the Greek place that we all used to go to after work, and Paul um, uh, wanted to be part of the gallery, so we decided that we were going to partner up. And we opened up, it wasn't, uh, I wouldn't call what we opened up originally a fine art gallery. Um, it was a gallery that, um, that dealt in architectural elements and all kinds of different things, and it was called Fire, uh, which was a great name. Uh, and the logo was, was flames, and they were on across the front of the gallery. And that was just fine until Laguna started burning. And now, then, is this the original location of the uh, Peter Blake Gallery on, on uh, Gallery Row? No, this was Coast in the Highway? Village Fair. Oh, okay. So, um, and, you know, when, when Laguna started burning, um, the name wasn't a really great name to have. I remembered the town was on fire, and, and here I am. I, I have this business with flames no. in, the, in the front of the, uh, the window. Uh, but I, after two years, I ended up moving the gallery to North Laguna. Um, it was, to me, closer to the museum. And it was um, a situation where I could actually grow the street and, and bring more galleries with me. It was, it was historically Gallery Row, but it wasn't called Gallery Row anymore. And I, I was fascinated by the idea that somehow or another I could, could redo Gallery Row and bring back Gallery Row. And I was fortunate that I had some friends that had opened galleries in town that listened to me. Uh, they had no reason to listen to me, but they did. Um, and we all formed Gallery Row together. Um, and it was Bill DeBilzin and a, a Russian dealer named Elena Zass and um, uh, Meyer and some different galleries. We all, we all ended up opening up in North Laguna. And we started the art walk up there. So what is it that excites you? I can see already that you're a renegade. <laughs> what is it that excites you about the type of art that you represent? Um, I, I love how powerful the art is, and yet it's so minimal. Uh, there's something, you know, in, in terms of that power, um, you know, I, I'm not a car uh, freak or anything, but they call certain cars sleepers. These cars are, you know, they look like the average car, but they have these outrageous engines and suspensions. And um, I, always, I always champion the sleeper. Uh, as opposed to a car that has a big, you know, whale tail on the back of it and front hood scoops and has an exhaust that you can hear down the street. Uh, the art that I represent is is quiet, um, but yet very powerful to those who who like it. I mean, I, I'll be the first person to admit that my art is not for everyone. Matter of fact, I would say 99% of the population uh, would look at what I do and, and think it was just totally stupid. Uh, but for me, uh, when I look at it, and it's also this interesting aspect of, I've had many artists over the years come to me and say, hey, I'm a minimalist too. And for all intents and purposes, they are. But I don't, I don't feel the power in their artwork that I do when I look at other artists. And even within the context of my own artists, um, the, you look at it, you think, well, what's the difference between that and every other thing they do? But yet, there's a certain painting, there's a certain body of work that's so much more powerful than other things that they've done. And you have to ask yourself, what is it about that? And it's really nothing more than what happens between my eye as that information travels to my brain and inevitably travels to my gut. Uh, and after all of that, it, it could even be just a, a chemical attraction similar to when you see 
um, a human being that you're attracted to, and not just physically attracted to, but uh, somehow or another you have this attraction. Well, I really like that person. That person makes me laugh. Or I really enjoy being around that person. Um, there, there's a, a something about the art, and, and one of the, the best things that happened to me was being untrained um, allowed me to be able to look at things and, and make decisions about what I like based on what I like. It's not uh, mm-hmm. what I find with, with people, and, and I would consider myself after 28 years a trained person, a trained eye, but what I found with people who had master's degrees, who worked for museums, who were really, you know, the, this is the foremost uh, uh, academic on this type of art, they, as soon as you start talking to them, they immediately look at something and they think, well, what's that in the context of? Um, what, where does that fit into the canon of art history? Where does that fit into, you know, geographic? Was this, is this the kind of art that was coming out of this place in the 50s or the 60s? And they're really bogged down with all this information, mm-hmm. albeit it's good information. Uh, for me, I was able to just look at things um, and, and, you know, even with Stephanie, who's been part of the gallery now, almost half of, um, half of its history, uh, we always ask ourselves when we see something and, and we like it, it all is defined by, do you want to bring it home and put it on your wall? And easy enough. Yeah. It, it's that easy for us. Uh, we can look at something and, and um, you know, it, that wasn't the case with my first wife, Fedna, uh, because we didn't share the same taste in art. Um, But we both knew what we liked enough to call art to show in our gallery. Um, You know, with Steph and I, we are very, um, we have a very similar sensibility. And we can just look at something, we can walk out of a studio and think, do you get that feeling that you want to just run back inside and grab one of those paintings and and buy it and, and, and bring it, literally bring it home and put it on the wall? And if that's the case, then that person's having a show. If you find yourself thinking, well, what is that curator going to think of that art? What is that collector going to think of that art? What is that critic going to think of that art? If you start second guessing everything and you start uh, tailoring it to any one thing, then there's something missing, then that's good enough to say, well, you know, I want to keep looking at this artist. I want to keep looking at this work. Because obviously there's a reason you went there in the first place. Um, It's very difficult to go to an artist studio and not start to work with them. Um, so before I even go to that art, artist studio, I already have a pretty good knowledge about who that artist is, what type of work they make, and whether there's a possibility, if not a probability, that we will be working together. Um, it's it's kind of like, why bother dating someone that you already know, you know, I can't. So, but how much of, because obviously you have been doing this for a long time, do you it's, it seems to be in the art world very much like in the music world that once somebody becomes commercially successful or has, you know, that all of a sudden they're they're like sold out or something. I mean, do you do you look at, at an artist's work and say, can I sell this? Is that in your mind no. when you? No, it's no. never, never. Um, art uh, for me and what I show is never dictated by money. Um, you know, if if that were the case, and I found myself second guessing what I do based on what I think someone's gonna like or buy, then I would never find my way into it. I mean, it, it, artists become commercially um, successful and inevitably they end up leaving my gallery. All my biggest artists that I started showing in the 90s uh, that no one would ever show have all left my gallery. I don't have, um, you know, luckily the gallery has segued into its next itineration, which is a, a what they call a secondary market gallery. So I'm going backwards now and selling the artwork I sold in the 90s from my clients who are afraid that their kids are going to dump the artwork and buy street art with it and not get what this art is worth. Mm. Um, so it, it, the, the gallery has transitioned from a primary gallery to a secondary gallery. Um, but in terms of commercial success, None of my artists um, went on to become successful because they shifted something they did. The market shifted to appreciate what they did. Yeah. So the museums all of a sudden took notice and major collectors took notice. And, you know, that's what happened. I remembered, um, you know, when we were young and, and R.E.M. was that hot band out of Athens, Georgia, that was making this music that God knows you couldn't understand a word that guy was saying. <laughs> um, but then all of a sudden that, you know, I remember like a few songs came out and they were playing on FM and, 
it was all of a sudden uncool to like REM, which up until then it was like REM and the Smiths and all these great bands. Um, but did REM change? Did shiny, happy people destroy the band? Did, did the money destroy the band? What was it? But yet REM to the end still made music that they wanted to make. It just so happened that the public tuned into it and became you know, interested in it. They never became pop music uh, stars. But I don't know any business owner. I mean, if you think of yourself more from the business perspective of it, how do you not consider bringing products to sell and not consider what's sellable or what people want? I mean, isn't that a kind of a, it seems contradictory to, you know, business 101. Yeah, no, I, um, uh, recently I was dealing with a, um, a, a gentleman who's a president of uh, a uh, fabric company called Dadar Milano. And, and Sergio's a very smart guy. And, and we were having a conversation. Um, I use uh, some fabrics and we'll, we'll discuss that whole, uh, another thing that the gallery turned into a few years ago. But I use his fabrics on some of the, um, uh, some of the, we call collectible design mm -hmm. because uh, furniture, it's not, it's not quite something that you can just call furniture. And some of these fabrics are three to five hundred dollars a yard, and they don't justify it. It'd be like you know putting the most expensive marble in the world in a condo that would never come. Mm -hmm. And he asked me, said, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued by you and, and some of the fabrics that you use from our company because you're using some of the most expensive fabrics. Do you factor in profitability when you do this? And I, I was kind of taken aback. I, I wanted. <laughs> I wanted to sound smart. I didn't want to sound really, you know, like, oh my God, you know, no, Sergio, I'm actually a, a business idiot that, you know, would never factor in, you know, yeah, I, I use your fabrics on things that, you know, it's just outrageous. Uh, because I remember when we first went to uh, one of the fabric houses that represent these fabrics and I said, oh, I, that's the fabric. I want that fabric. And he said, you do? I said, yeah. And he said, you know, just for the record, that, that fabric is however many hundreds of dollars a yard. And it was very, it was a very simple fabric. It wasn't like it was gold, uh, there was gold woven in this fabric. It's not like this wallpaper that looks like, this is really complicated. It's actually really gold, yeah. Yeah, it's really complicated wallpaper. This was a very simple fabric. And, oh, you know, the only other person that's ever bought that fabric was Brad Pitt. <laughs> and I, you know, on the one hand, I kind of thought, well, Brad Pitt's a cool guy, but I, Brad Pitt is a wealthy person. Yeah. And what does that say? Do I have to find someone at the wealth level of Brad Pitt to uh, to buy this furniture to make up the five or $600 a yard, the $6,000 worth of fabric that went into a sofa? Um, but I remember telling myself, no, I have to find someone who's sophisticated and wealthy enough to buy that fabric. And I'm not going to ever get anywhere, again, by second guessing profitability. Now, I... I have left a lot of money on the table um, because I didn't uh, focus on profitability, but I also have to be happy. And I also have to get up in the morning and really love to do what I want to do. And it, the minute I felt like, I have these bad dreams sometimes that I've walked into my gallery and there's some artwork in there that I'm really like, oh my God. And there's like burgundy velvet curtains up and, and it's, it's, it's really weird. <laughs> Uh, and I think, oh my God! And then I wake up in the morning. I think, oh, thank God that that you know yeah. that that didn't happen to me. I I could never imagine. I would just close the gallery if it yeah. came down to if it came down to showing things that I didn't want to show or based on um, you know again uh, to quote uh, uh, my friend Sergio, profitability. Uh, yeah, profitability is part of it. I have become profitable over the years despite myself. Would be probably uh, more like it. Um, but the same artists that I used to show back in the early 90s that would lose money went on to become artists that, uh, you know, I, I recently sold a painting that I sold to a guy for $15,000 for $250,000. Wow. I don't know if that would have happened if all I was thinking to myself was, well, you know, in this month's Dwell magazine, this is what's really hot. And what I really need to do is focus in and, and at the same time, the Pantone color of the year is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone wants this color and everything is leaning towards this direction. And I spent two hours at Restoration Hardware today and then stopped in at Minotti and, and Roche Bobois. And now I've put together this concept of what's hot. So now I need to find artists that fit within the context of that. Yeah, no, that's not right. But uh, that's not to say that intuitively 
we're not informed by our lives on a daily basis. So everything that's happening, it, it could be as easy as I'm sitting in this room right now and there are certain colors and there are certain things that are happening that are activating my, uh, you know, my intuitive qualities and, and I'm, I'm looking at things and, and all of a sudden I, I, might, I might go home and be inspired by this certain taupe that's running through here and, and the way that taupe plays off of the green in your yard and the blue sky and all of a sudden that comes back and it, I find that you know an artist is making a body of work that's incorporating those colors or incorporating the feeling that I'm having in this living room right now and all of a sudden that, that connects. So we don't really know what it's a very is personal important. Thing. Yeah, oh no, it's, it's very, so very that's personal. why it's called the Peter Blake Gallery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so is that the hardest part about running a business or about running a gallery is is having to really put your passion ahead of what would be business 101 budgetary or what is the hardest part about running a gallery? It seems like it would be a really a lot of work in my opinion. Well, the the hardest part for me is staying interesting to me. So 28 years later, what interests me about this gallery is what's important to me. And in the process of keeping myself interested, um, I keep clients interested. And then there's always a, a progression of, of the gallery as it, as it shifts, um, you know, year in and year out. Um, and it, it, you know, there are all these things that are happening, all these things that are informing me. And as I'm keeping myself interested, Fortunately, I'm keeping the gallery interesting to others because it's easy for people to become bored uh, with an art gallery. And the average art gallery lasts about two years. Mm -hmm. And you're a veteran at five years. At 28 years, um, there's really no telling what, what you've done to last in this business for 28 years. You either, I, I said this, I think on my 10 year anniversary, you're either good at what you do or you're a con man. <laughs> You know, so it's very difficult to, to stay in this business for that long. There are very few of us who have stayed in this business this long. Um, but to stay in this business this long, you have to constantly be reinventing yourself. You have to constantly um, keep things interesting. You have to constantly bring people into uh, what you do. And, and that's hard. Talk to me about the process of choosing artists. How do you know who you're going to work with? And if somebody wanted to be represented by Peter Plague, what does that process look like? Well, you know, part of what uh, what I was just talking about is the real deal. So you can you can pretty much sit down and and start you know talking to someone and realize whether this person is fake. Um, you know, are they a walking press release or are they the real deal? I mean, do they call you up and say, "Hey, can you come look at stuff?" Yeah, they, yeah. yeah. Sometimes they they call you up. Um, most of the time, um, you'll get an artist, uh, one of your own artists, my own artist. Mm -hmm. They'll call me up and say, you know. Like yesterday is a perfect example. I, I got a call from a, a, a guy who I respect and he's in, in the auction world. And he asked me, you know, what do you think of this artist? And we had a, a long conversation about that artist. And, you know, I, I've known this artist for a long time. I've known their work for a long time. I don't know the artist personally. Um, and he asked me, well, it doesn't it fit into the context of what you do and why didn't you ever show that artist? And you know, there were some, some missteps in this artist's career that where that person made art that seemed like it was made for profit. Mm. Uh, and I didn't, didn't think that that artist actually um, was the real deal as a result of that. But what happens in the art world inevitably, and, and there's an artist that, um, that I've mentored for years that I've never really shown, um, who now is becoming one of the biggest artists in the world and, and just watching her grow and you know, encouraging her to make changes, to stay true to what she does. To you know, there there are these these lines that always stick in the in the in my mind. My gallery is only as good as my worst artist. That show is only as good as the worst painting in it. Um, that's not a real positive way of looking at things because if I identify the worst painting in the show and I ask myself, is that show only as good as that painting? I'll remove that painting. And these are some of the things that that I was able to teach this artist and mentor this artist. And, and in many ways, this artist has always be, almost become too big for my own gallery. Um, she's, what does that mean when an artist becomes too big? That's an artist who has been picked up by one of the biggest galleries in the world. And now those galleries control that artist 
And that means that they can galleries, only put out so much work. they can only put out so much work. And that big gallery always has clients that are going to buy the artists that they say, this is one of those artists. So, you know, in my case, some of my favorite artists have been picked up by the biggest galleries in the world. And they're working on museum shows. And you know, there's always this, this um, a transitional stage where, you know, the, the big gallery is like, you know, look, you know, we're always going to work together. And, and the artist is, you know, look, I love you. I, I, we're always going to work together. But then they can't help themselves. It's not because they, they want to somehow or another turn their backs. Look, I'm sure the Rolling Stones would like to go back and play that bar. They, they, you know, if that, that bar owner came back to them and said, Mick, do you remember me? I was the guy that gave you your first break. Remember that, yeah. that you know, I used to pay you uh, 100 uh, pounds a, a week to play in my bar. What do you mean you're not ever going to play in my bar again? It's not that they don't want to come back and play in that yeah. bar. It's not that they're not appreciative. But there's a promoter out there that's telling them that, oh, no, you've got show dates from here to Asia, and you're playing Madison Square Garden. When do you think you're going to go play that bar? And when you do step foot inside that bar and someone takes a picture of you, we have licensing contracts that prohibit the sale of that stuff. So, no, we can't control it. Therefore, you can't do it. And then that person... You know, Mick Jagger can walk into that guy's house and play for his kid's birthday party, I guess. But he can't. He can, there are certain things he can't do. And the same with uh, with my artists. They can't give me paintings around the big gallery, and they don't have paintings to give me even if they wanted to, because there. Once you hit and you hit at that level, every painting you make is spoken for, and it almost takes kind of the fun. I, I've I've seen that in some of the artists that. You know, you go through it and they, they think to themselves, you, you go through the initial stages of, of an artist and they think, oh my God, if I could only show in that gallery. Then they're in the gallery. Oh my God, I'm having a solo show. Oh my God, I'm having a solo show. <laughs> and then it turns into, well, could I, could I leave my job teaching? Could I leave my job cocktail waitressing? Could I leave my job um, painting houses? Could I leave my job and become a full-time artist? What a dream that would be. Oh my God, I've got four shows lined up this year and I've got other galleries asking me, you know, now I've got to produce 15 paintings for this show and 20 paintings for that show. And you realize, did, did this just become a job? Did my passion just become a job? So there's, there's, there are all these dynamics going around. And, and you know, to be an, a, a creative, usually creatives are very different. They're very different personalities. Um, you know, it, it could be, uh, said that, you know, they're very different than, than you and I. And, and I consider myself a creative to some, uh, some degree. Um, you know, I have to install, Stephanie and I install um, shows where we make art with the art that we're given. So, you know, they're almost, you know, our shows are collages. We're very, the way we design our shows. So in many ways, um, you know, I am a creative person, um, but I but also have to be- you never a paintbrush? I did one time. Did you? Yeah, I did. I, I made a painting. Um, you know, it, it was probably one of the most um, educational uh, things that had ever happened to me. And by now, I was a dealer for many years. Uh, a woman came to the gallery, and she said that we're working on um, we're working on the show uh, of business people making art, not artists, but business people making art. And we're going to um, auction all these paintings off to raise money. I think it was for for battered women. And she said, "I need you to I need you to make a painting." I said, oh, no, no, I've never made a painting before. And she's like, no, 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 I, I, this is really important to me, Peter. You have to do this. And I thought, okay, fine, I'll do this. All right, well, tell me a little bit about the other design elements because you do have uh, furniture mm -hmm. um, in the gallery and I've seen a lot of it on your website and they're always beautiful pieces. And I go in there and you say, don't sit on that. And I'm like, gosh, darn it, there's a oh sofa, I thought. I know, I know. So tell me, what got you into that, and how is that related? Is it the same type of client that buys your art that would buy this? Or? I thought it was. I thought it was. I thought it was brilliant. Um, so one summer, we're anticipating the usual thing that happens in summer in the gallery is that we get the, the beach tourist, and the beach tourist is coming there to buy beach art. And they're walking past the gallery, and you can hear the laughs down the street. <laughs> Um, and, you know, my kid could do that. 
oh, come in here, son. I want to show you what horrible contemporary art looks like. And, and you know, we were bracing ourselves for it. After all these years, it, it really, it doesn't matter to me anymore. You know, hey, my kid could do that. If your kid could do that, please have them do 10 paintings for me. We'll have a solo show and we'll get rich. You know, mm -hmm. I, I learned how to, you know, come back on all of that, make myself feel better. Um, <laughs> but then we thought, well, what if we had a show for all the furniture that we had collected? Well, that, that'd be kind of cool. It would be a summer show. Nobody's got, clients aren't coming in anyway. Uh, why not just go ahead and have a show and then we could live with all this furniture that we've never lived with because the furniture usually goes from the auction house, it gets shipped to the restorer. The restorer restores it. We go, we inspect it. Once we say, okay, it's perfect, we have it wrapped in blankets and it gets brought to storage. So we've never lived with any of this stuff. We didn't have any idea how much of it we'd even bought. So we start moving it into the gallery and then it's like, oh my God, this is so incredible. We had this show called Tendency of the Moment. And Tendency of the Moment implied that this was the tendency of the moment and here were the, influence, the influences of that time. So when, when people learned how to bend tube steel, all of a sudden tube steel found its way into interiors. When people learned how to bend wood, then all of a sudden you had bent wood furniture when certain aspects of design were being dictated by, uh, by new products that were being invented. And I, I remembered I bought a, uh, a Mercedes from the 60s. And the reason for that was the tendency of the moment was to have fins. And Mercedes didn't want to have fins in their cars, but they couldn't sell cars in America unless they had those fins. And I was fascinated by that. So we bought a, a black Mercedes sedan that had fins and it was supposed to be in the show. Um, stereo equipment, um, doorknobs, all these different things. The, the show had transcended now furniture and had gone into industrial design and, and all these things. And it, it was from the 30s through the 70s and it was a, a retrospective of all of these decades and, and it was multi uh, country. So all these different countries, furniture from France, from Denmark, from uh, Asia, all these different places. And we had, the, um, no, we didn't sell a thing. Um, we had the show. I, I didn't, um, didn't intend on selling my things. You know, this was, this was a very difficult thought to sell these things. But at the same time, when the show closed and we hadn't sold anything, this was going back to the painting thing. Now I'm thinking, what's wrong with my clients? <laughs> I thought there would be at least one yeah. client. People that, trying to twist my arm. You know, please, you know, make me that <laughs> offer I can't refuse. Just would somebody just yeah. say something? I remember one of my best clients came in and, and I was expecting her, like everyone else, to just fall to their knees mm -hmm. uh, when they saw this show. And she says, so what's the big deal? It's just a bunch of brown furniture. And she has this very deep, Arkansas accent. She's a very close friend of mine and, and what a, a world-class collector with an incredible eye. And I just thought, so what's the big deal? It's just brown furniture. Okay. So anyway, yeah. my, my gallery director, who's um, a very, very smart person, says to me, well, Peter, why don't we put this on First Dibs? First Dibs is the, the, the go-to yeah. place for, for all things fine, the mm -hmm. purveyors of the fine. And I said, well, why would we do that? This, this is my furniture. And she said, well, that furniture has kind of an international, by now we've realized we're getting press internationally. We're getting a lot of attention outside of this area and outside of my clients. Uh, but the design world has taken notice of this show. Well, and, and if you think about that, when you go to Europe, that's when you do see those, you know, more retro pieces. And sure. I was just there and I was thinking, you know, that's very different than how we live in California. Yeah. Yeah, and, and even, you know, what uh, uh, when you go to Palm Springs and you see some of these time capsules mm -hmm. and you see some of these outrageous designs. And, and her, her, her point was to put these on our sites and lure people in to the gallery via design because there, there's someone sitting in Singapore right now that's looking for a Jean Array chair. There's someone sitting in Sydney right now thinking about that table or thinking about collecting, they're building collections and they need that, that designer in their collection. And had you done any exhibiting online at that point? No. But what, what, what her, her point was that that will bring people to the gallery and then we can sell them art. Because obviously there's, there's a cohesive thread running through the design and the art. 
and it's all minimal. It's all in the, to a certain degree masculine. There's nothing frou frou or decorative about this stuff. It's pretty hard edge. And sure enough, she was right. And it brought people to the gallery. And then as it hit first dibs, it brought people from all over the world that wanted to buy the furniture. We jokingly call the gallery anywhere but here. Because we sell <laughs> our art and our furniture anywhere but here. Yeah. Um, I wish that the day comes that Orange County becomes a market for us, but it never has been. It probably never will be. Um, and in that sense, we started to come to terms with having to sell our own stuff, which we started to do because, as Steph likes to say, when I get aggravated that I've lost something at auction, she'll always say, there's another auction. Yeah. And you know what? There's another auction an hour from now. There's been three auctions while I've been sitting here, and all three of them had things I wanted to buy in them. So, Peter, over the last decade, your gallery has participated in a lot of uh, prestigious art fairs, including the Armory Show, Art Los Angeles Contemporary, Design Miami, Design Miami Basil, or Basil, Potato, Potato, <laughs> Expo Chicago, and Seattle Art Fair. Is that something that you uh, are consider yourself continuing to do? And, and what's the reason for going outside the gallery? Well, um, uh, I do see a future in art fairs. I don't see us doing as many. I mean, there have been years that we did as many as nine art fairs a year. Um, I am very proud of the art fairs that our gallery has been accepted in. These are the some of the finest art fairs in the world, and they're very difficult to get into. Um, and that's a, a source of pride for the gallery. All right, Peter, I think you know we do a little thing here on Delphine Circle called The Big Questions. And this is where we try to dive deep and get you to express yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any consistent daily routines? Um, no, I, I get up in the morning and I'm happy to be alive. I'm, I look around me and uh, lately, I, you know, in the last year I get up and, and I see my gallery, which is new. Um, you know, a year ago, Stephanie and I moved into the gallery. Uh, but overall, I, I get up, um, you know, I look over and I see Stephanie there and uh, that's usually the way I start my day. Um, but, you know, for me, I, I get up every morning. I see Stephanie there. Now I get up in the morning and I'm in my gallery, which is the next thing was to get up in the morning and then go to the gallery, yeah. uh, which was always the highlight of my day. I love going to the gallery. Um, and now I wake up inside my gallery, which makes it even better. Yeah. And a couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to buy the building. And uh, now I own that building. And, you know, we... We have designed every square inch of that building. We've designed a life around that building. And, and it's, um, it's a, a really interesting thing. And, and you know, in that sense, um, I don't really have a routine, but I, I do live a routine life. I mean, I, I don't do a lot of things outside. I don't really have a lot of hobbies. I, uh, my business is my hobby. I, I work from 5 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. I love what I do. I work seven days a week. I don't really know... Because I've blurred the lines between work and play, I don't really know where those lines go. Um, you know, it, it's uh, um, you know we've known each other on a social level, and yet you know here we are discussing business, and yet I still look over at you and I see the Delphine that I socialized yeah. with for many years. I don't, I don't view this as business. It, it's it's a really weird thing, but yet um, the context of our conversation up until now has been business. Um, and I think maybe the big questions are heading to, towards something more social and spiritual. I can see that in your face. Well, so. we have to, of course, um, talk about your beautiful wife, Stephanie Bacciero. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. Good. <laughs> and I have to say, tell the story, because when I first met you, this was before you had met Stephanie, and you said to me, I would never get married again. <laughs> I would never get married. And I said, Peter, never say never. You never know. So when you announced your uh, engagement, it set uh, all of the social circle uh, uh, a tizzy. And we were all like, oh, my gosh, Peter's actually going to do it. And, of course, your wife is so beautiful and so wonderful. And uh, the fact that you guys are work and live together is always a challenge. But she's also an incredible artist sculptor and you also represent her art in the gallery as well mm -hmm. so that's fun yes i was I'm very fortunate to say that i i married two soulmates in my in one lifetime oh. uh both with fatna and um uh, with stephanie um and it, it, you know they're both very different uh, matter of fact right before we came here we were at fatness 
uh, you know, she's getting new wood floors in her house. And we went by to see them because we were really excited. I got some pictures text over to us and I knew that we were coming in the neighborhood. So I thought this would be uh, kind of fun. But Does she still have her boutique? Yes, yes she, has, uh, she has the boutique um, uh, when she moved to Crystal Cove about a year ago and mm -hmm. uh, was a great loss to, uh, to Laguna. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I had to get used to not driving past that building that we had designed together back in 2000. And all of a sudden now it was a flooring place as opposed to a place where I would drive by and see clothes and see the art and everything else that, um, that we had done together. Uh, but we go to Crystal Cove uh, three or four times a week and uh, we go and hang out with Fetna and, and we go to Press Juice uh, and uh, we, you know, we, we provide a lot of the artwork and furniture for Fetna's boutique. Um, she had changed um, her boutique and, and calls it now Fetna Blake Concept. And it's a concept of fashion, art, and design, oh, wow. uh, which we've been uh, really happy to be a proud of and uh, very proud to be a part of. Um, so that's been great. And, you know, when I said I didn't, um, I ne would never get married again, I, I, you know, I, Marriage to me was a very, um, it just kind of happened. You know, we, we got up one day and, and we eloped and got married. There was no, uh, no formal thing about getting married. I never was never thinking about a big wedding. And matter of fact, we didn't even have rings. Um, and then the same thing happened with Stephanie. We, we didn't, this wasn't a sit down and talk about it. A friend of ours, um, who's a huckster, uh, we were at Pelican Hill on like Christmas day or a major holiday. And, he went out and posted that, you know, he was a photographer and he's, he's kind of a, the documentarian of the L.A. art world and thought that he was going to crack this joke and say that that he was breaking the news that Stephanie and I were getting married. And by the time I get back, I have like a thousand emails and all these posts on Facebook because he posted it on Facebook back when Facebook was cool. And I realized that, you know, now what do I do? He went out and told everybody that we were getting married. Do I say that, no, we're not, and somehow or another it looks like I wouldn't want to marry Stephanie, or <laughs> no, we're not, and then it looks like she doesn't want to marry me? Right. How stupid. How did I find myself in this situation? And, you know, this, this conversation is taking place, you know, over the next few days, and I, I find myself driving, and I called Steph, and I said, you know what, let's just get married. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> let's just get married. So let's just get married means that, okay, call Call the city of Laguna Beach. I think they, they'll marry us. Um, well, we call the city of Laguna Beach, and and I have this thing. Let's get married before the end of the year. So we couldn't we couldn't fit it in, uh, but we could get into Laguna Niguel, and we went to Laguna Niguel and got married in this totally nondescript government looking building. And they had a um, they had this room that that went in. It was like right out of some Home Depot nightmare. And we got married, and they got a picture of us, and. We went up and we signed our paperwork and the girl behind the counter asked if, if Stephanie would be taking my name. And I said, yes. And she made a face and I thought, you know, why would you make that face? Said, well, it's a lot easier, you know, when you inevitably divorce, yeah. uh, to, you know, if you haven't changed the name, it's a lot easier. So this is you know, obviously a girl who's seen her share of divorces, but long story short, I got married the same way I got married the first time. The marriage was about love. It wasn't about about all that stuff that went with it. We came home and a, a friend of mine, Chris Keller, who owns the Marine Room and the rooftop deck called me and says, hey, what's going on? I said, oh, nothing, I got married. He said, you got married. And you didn't invite me? Chris, no, it's not like that. I just got married and we went to the justice of the peace. It's no big deal. I, you know, I was calling him about something that was, you know, I had to talk to him about. It's like, hang on a second. So you just got married. Are you having a reception? No, I'm not. No, no, no. You're having a reception up on the rooftop deck. You're having a reception on the rooftop deck. No, I'm not. I don't want to have a reception. I don't want to do that. You know, and... Wait a minute. I think I came to one at the Marine Room. You did. <laughs> you did. So we start talking about it, and and I jokingly said, I'll, I'll have it at, at your dive bar, the Marine Room. It goes, okay, perfect. When do you want to have it? I said, Chris, I'm joking. I'm not going to get have my wedding reception at a dive bar. Next thing I know... That afternoon, I sit down with my gallery director at the time, and we put together this invitation. It's a picture of Steph and I um, kissing, and it um, it says, you know, it, we were engaged for I think like nine days, um, and we are we've been married for nine hours, and now we're we're having this reception on this date, and everyone's invited. And on a Sunday afternoon, 
we had a reception at the Marine Room at like two o'clock and all of our friends showed up. It was like the most incredible wedding that I'd ever been to. Um, and having been the ring boy for every Greek wedding that took place within a hundred mile radius in the New York, New Jersey <laughs> metropolitan area, I'd grown sick of weddings by the time I was 10. Uh, and now all of a sudden I, I had this great wedding and my mother-in-law, you know, uh, threw her, her deal into it. Um, I thought I was outside and, and it was time that the wedding was over. And, and I thought, great, we can go home now. And someone came in and said, you know, your, your mother-in-law wants you inside. And I said, for what? The, you know, the wedding's over. And she, I looked up at the podium and I, I could see that she had what looked like a bunch of pages together. And I knew oh. uh, this, this wasn't, I wasn't going to just get out of this with the, the Peter Blake wedding at the, at the dive bar. So she said, you know, my son-in-law, who I love, you know, thought he was going to keep me from having the rice. And she throws the <laughs> rice at me. Oh, All funny. the aspects of the wedding that I kept her from having for yeah. her daughter, oh. she provided. Yeah. She provided the wedding cake. She provided all these things. And we finally had, you know, for the last 15 minutes of our wedding, what appeared to be a traditional wedding. Peter, tell me something that people would be surprised to know about you. I have a dog. We do. Nobody's surprised. We see you walk in the beach. Well, I, I've never had a dog before. I've never wanted a dog before, but I actually uh, I actually have a dog now. Is it a boy or a girl? It's a girl. I she's, love that she's dog. Cute. She's very she's, cute. I, you know, she could be not cute. She rips my fingers to pieces. My arms are full of pop marks, uh, but I love that little dog. Yay. Do you have a book that has influenced you in your life? No, uh, there was a book I read during the pandemic, um, two books I read. One book was given by, um, by a constituent, uh, and it had to do with uh, some, of the, uh, some of the noted presidents uh, throughout time. And, you know, I think she gave me the book so that I could learn from them and, and learn how to be a statesman, which I have never really been. Um, but in, in the end, ironically, and I, I mentioned this to her, the book just taught me that a lot of the people that were in the book, the Abraham Lincolns of the world, actually were ass kickers. And, and they, they did things their own way. They they endured and, and they stood up. Um, they stood their ground. And they weren't these, these gross politicians that I see today. Um, so that book was very influential, just knowing that, that some of the most important presidents in our history had also been people like myself that stood up and, and just, you know, didn't didn't take shit from anybody and, and pretty much didn't tell the line from anybody. I um, mean, that book was really good. And there was another book that talked about um, being able to release yourself and being able to just say, you know what? I'm really busy. You were quoted as saying, I came from nothing. I didn't go to college. I didn't go to art school. I worked seven days a week, but you couldn't pay me a million dollars to move anywhere else, any city in the world. I love this town. How long have you been in Laguna? And what was your motive for running as a city council person? I was in Dallas for about two years before Fetner woke up one morning and she said, I, I don't want to live here anymore. And I love Dallas. Um, she said, we're out of here. And as far as I'm concerned, we can go back to New York or D.C. One of those two places, pick the place and we'll go. I said, you know, I really want to go to California. I've always had this thing for California. And she said, look... <laughs> I followed you to Dallas, Texas, and I'm not following you to California. I said, can we go to California for you know, vacation? What if you go to California for two weeks or a month or something? She said, okay. I said, okay, let's, let's just kind of take our time because I, I do like Dallas and um, it's not just you just get up and leave. So I started getting the newspaper um, from California, from Southern California. I identified La Jolla as the town I wanted to move to. And La Jolla looks like a, a really beautiful place. And, you know, when you come from bad weather and the first thing usually on that top of the newspaper is today's weather is 72 and sunny. Today's weather is 72 and sunny. But damn, you know, is it ever not 72 and sunny? Uh, oh, we, we, you know, we hit 74 and sunny. So we, um, I convinced her to come to California. We ended up in La Jolla on like, um, I think it was Labor Day or somewhere in there. A very busy day, and Fetna had some friends that were living in um, in uh, Westwood, and we were going to go to a Persian restaurant for Persian food. And we drove up to um, up to LA, and we went to this restaurant in Westwood. 
On the way back, we stopped in San Clemente for gas. And I remember thinking, oh, there's something really beautiful about this. And, and more than just, obviously, it's beautiful. There's the ocean and these hills and everything. But there was something about the, the air and the light. And, and I just thought, I, I really love it here. And um, I said, can we hang out here for a while? And she said, sure. What difference does it make? We went and we got a, we got a hotel room and, and we stayed in San Clemente. And I found myself falling in love with San Clemente. I didn't want to go back to La Jolla. And um, I said, look, I, I really am not ready to leave. By that time, we had driven down Crystal Cove and uh, that whole area with those cliffs and Laguna. And, and um, I said, you know, I, I, let's just stay in, in, in San Clemente for a while. We didn't have any money, um, so we had to get jobs. I got a job, um, you know, working in this uh, this cafe on this street called Del Mar in, in San Clemente. And by that time, I was I had fallen in love with, with Southern California. There was no leaving it. And we, we settled down in San Clemente. I, and I think, you know, Fenton at, the point, at that point would admit to it, but I think she was also had, fall, she had fallen in love with, with Southern California. And we both got jobs in this restaurant. And we, um, we found ourselves gravitating towards Laguna Beach on our days off. And it wasn't long before we realized that Laguna Beach was the place that we wanted to live. And we got ourselves an apartment in Laguna Beach with an ocean view. I uh, started working on opening night at Romeo Cucina. Um, and the restaurant was incredibly busy and I was working at that time, you know, six nights a week, making like $200 a night, which, you know, $1,200 a week in cash, um, was a lot of money. Um, and at, now, this is like in the, you know, this is 1990 now, um, I got here in 88. So this is 1990 and, you know, everything just kind of fell into place. And there was this, um, this just total attraction to Laguna Beach and the people of Laguna Beach and everything about Laguna. There's another side of Laguna that's not progressive, and I think this is part of what you deal with um, on the city council. There's also there's a long term residents that have lived there. Um, you know, my ex husband Clay being one of them. Um, people who grew up in Laguna feel very covetous of Laguna and yeah. trying to keep Laguna into a certain style, a certain way, and not really wanting a lot of development. When I heard that you were elected to the city council, I was like, OMG, Peter's <laughs> going to get in there and fuck some shit up <laughs> because you are a forward thinker. You love contemporary things, modern things, which is really the antithesis of what we had been seeing at that point from the city council. And having lived in Laguna since 89, so I got there a year before you did and owned a home there until last year, um, I've seen a lot of what was going on. So... You know, to, to love a town like we both do, Laguna, um, but then to jump into the fire, which is what you did when you when you took on the city council. What was your thinking about going on to the board? Well, I um, I don't I'm not much of a complainer, and I uh, I found myself complaining. Um, I don't like this. I don't like that. I'm sick and tired of of all these homeless people on the beach, and uh, we're turning into Venice and Santa Monica. Who's going to stop that? Um, I'm so tired of hearing about, you know, we can't seem to get really cool businesses in town. And, and why are these people showing up and stopping? Why can't we have chain businesses? What's wrong with the chain business? I'm not talking about having, you know, eight Taco Bells Trader in town. Jones. But yeah, what, what's wrong with, you know, what's wrong with having a, a polo shop? What's wrong with having, um, you know, like Lido did. Lido totally curated um, their whole area down in, in the Cannery Village. And they weren't going after Louis Vuitton or or, uh, or uh, East San Laurent or any of those things like El Paseo did um, in uh, in the desert. They went after hip businesses that were experiential uh, retail, and they had a certain level that they were looking for, and they did an incredible job. Now, they brought in the Nobus of the world, the more established restaurants. They brought in the Elise Walkers. Um, but at the same time, they brought in cool candle places and all these cool places that uh, that made for a shopping experience. Well, thank you, Peter, so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and I can't wait to see what you'll come up with next. <laughs> thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Delphine Circle. If you enjoyed the episode, please check out our last two. And remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Delphine. Welcome to my circle. <laughs>